that song. Well, I'm looking forward to having Brother Wood preach for us tonight as well. If you were here Friday night or Saturday or this morning, you got to hear this man, this dear servant of the Lord. I've enjoyed getting to know him the last few days, been challenged, been encouraged, been convicted, and been excited. And I'm looking forward to the service tonight. Now, tonight I've asked him uh, to kind of give us a good charge on reaching and soul winning. And so he's going to preach from the God's Word. He's going to touch us tonight. The Lord's going to touch us. And I hope you're ready to hear from God tonight. Are you ready? If you're not ready, get ready. Our obligation is to be good soil. And so we can silence the cell phones, set aside the distractions for a few moments, and let God speak to us and our hearts be open to him. So, Brother Wood, you come and speak the word of God to us. May God touch us tonight. Thank you, preacher. Said you ought to be here. Open your Bible with me tonight, if you would, to the Gospel of Mark. I want you to look with me, please, if you would, at Mark chapter 5. And I'll give you two verses in a moment that I'd like to share with you. Mark chapter 5. Words would fail me to tell you what these last few days have meant for me. It really would. I have found in life that when three or four days seems like a week or a month, two things could have happened. They're opposite. One, it's very, very bad. And the other, it's very, very good. And I might tell you that the last few days to me have just been like an oasis of God's blessing. It's been very, very good. Your pastor, the staff, they could not have done more to make me or our ministry team or anyone else to be more comfortable. It's been wonderful. And they have, and I know that you appreciate them as members of this church, but I want to tell you as a visitor, uh, nobody ever does it any better. They have done fantastic. And then your encouragement to me, I have met many of you personally, and I look around, I took time while the singing was going around to look at faces, and I said, I know a lot of those people now. I can recognize them. I've always been a little bad on names, but I remember faces. And so God bless you, and as God brings you to mind, and we'll be praying for you, and I trust you'll be praying for us. It's been an absolute wonderful, wonderful time. I might tell you that as far as our heart and our ministry is concerned, I think that God has begun to plant some things that are going to grow and bloom into tremendous things as far as winning people to Christ and seeing the work of God in churches go forward in America. It's been absolutely wonderful. So thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for the privilege of being with you tonight. Again, I'm going to ask you, how many of you have your Bible? If you have it, would you hold it up for just a moment? And uh, great, great. That's quite a sight. Now, would you stand with me as we read a couple of verses together? And we're going to jump right into the middle of a long story that has to do with a man that we sometimes call the maniac of Gadaria, or the healing of the demonic man from Gadaria. But I'm going to jump into the end of that story. After this man had come face to face with Jesus Christ, after his sins had been forgiven, after he had a brand new beginning in his life, we find verse, if you look with me, in verse 18. The Bible said as Jesus was leaving that area, we'll tell you the conditions in a moment, but when Jesus was leaving that area, the Bible said, and when he was coming to the ship. Now we'll find a separate he, he that had been possessed with the devil. The first pronoun he refers to our Savior Jesus Christ. The second pronoun refers to a man that had just been saved that had just been clothed, was in his right mind, had his life turned around, and he had a brand new beginning. So look at verse 18 again. And when Jesus was coming to the ship, I like the verb tense of this, he that had been possessed with the devil. Do you see that past tense? He that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Wonderful request. But, verse 19, how be it Jesus suffered him not. In other words, he said, no. Could I be with you? No. Then look at the rest of the verse. But saith unto him, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and has had compassion on thee. Now, Lord Jesus, tonight, I feel that we need a special touch upon our heart. I do. Holy Spirit, we open ourselves to you and ask you to touch us. I pray, God, that the result of this service would literally be scores and scores and even hundreds of people would hear the gospel. 
because of commitments made here tonight by the part of your people. May not one person be able to sit here tonight and not come face to face with the drawing, the challenge of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray if there be one here that's not saved, that tonight would be the hour of salvation. God, please don't let anybody leave this service and die and spend an eternity in a literal hell. Then, God, I pray above all that glory would be brought to thy name and we would be pleasing as your servants that we could be pleasing to you. And we'll thank you for that, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated if you would, please. I think sometimes one of the most wonderful things that parents could do for their children, and particularly that grandparents could do for their grandchildren, is to tell them some of the great stories of the Bible. And I mean, take them down to their level so they can really understand them and can see what God was doing in the lives and through the verses in the scripture. So it is with this wonderful story. Here is a story of the Lord Jesus sailing across the Sea of Galilee and getting to a country known as the land of the Gadareans. And there was a man in Gadarea that you and I would identify as somebody that was an outscourge of society. Here's a man that was so homeless he was naked. Here's a man that was in such bad shape because of sin the citizens had to take him and chain him up and keep him in a cave outside of the city. But eventually you'll find that when Jesus, he landed that ship and went into the land, he came face to face with this man. And I'm glad to tell you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, there has never been a case that's too hard for God. And regardless of how far down somebody can get, I want to tell you the power of God can reach down and pick that person up and give them a brand new beginning. And that's exactly what happened to this man. This man who was naked, this man that was wailing due to sin and the problems of sin in his life, this man that had obviously lost his orientation to even what was reasonable thinking, all of a sudden we find him clothed and in his right mind. That's the power of God and what God can do in somebody's life. But then a few verses skip by, and we find, and I'll tell you why in a few moments, we find why Jesus is leaving the area quickly. And as he's walking down the seaside and getting into the ship, all of a sudden this man comes down and has a reasonable request, Lord, <laughs> I'd like to be with you. And the Lord answered him, no. Have you ever looked through this passage and noticed there are three different prayers in this passage? Not one, there are three. Look back with me for just a minute. Look at the first one in verse 10. In verse 10, the Bible said, and he besought him. Now that he refers to a demon named Legion. The Bible says this man was so deep in sin, it was not one demon, but a legion of demons that was destroying his life. And the leader of those demons, he called himself Legion, noted in verse nine. And the Bible said that this demon was praying. Can you imagine that? Here's a demon praying to Jesus. The Bible said in verse 10, and he besought him much, not just a little bit, but he prayed fervently that he would not send them away out of the country. You know what that demon was praying for? He was very simply saying, Jesus, don't put us in hell right now. Don't send us to hell right now. Do you know the devil and the demons of hell know they've already lost? You know the devil and the demons of hell know that hell was prepared for them for all eternity? And you know they will be locked up there and they already know that. And here's this demon saying, don't send us away out of this country at this time. And you know God answered that prayer? It's very interesting, isn't it? You say, why did he do that? It was not the consummation of ages yet. And the demons were talking about the swine that was feeding. You remember the story, how the demons were sent down, out, away from this man and into the swine. And those swine went down the side of the seashore and drowned. I've tried to do a little research on that. Nobody can be certain exactly the number that went and what happened, but somebody has speculated and said in today's dollar, that may have been somewhere around $220,000 worth of investment that was drowned. Now I'll tell you, that's a lot of pig. That's a whole lot of pig. I think Bob Evans and Cracker Barrel would probably be out of business with bacon and sausage if that happened in this area, I'm not sure. But it so affected the citizenship that those that had lost money, obviously, and the other citizens, they came down and began to just give prayer number two. Prayer number one was by the demons. Would you not send us to hell at this time? 
And Jesus answered that prayer. Then in verse 17, notice the second prayer, and they, notice the pronoun is plural, it is the citizens of the area, they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. Very simply, they were saying, Jesus, get out of town. Jesus, leave us alone. Lord, just get away from here. They wanted nothing to do with him. And I want you to know that Jesus answered that prayer. Because I'll tell you, Jesus never goes anywhere he's not wanted. He never intrudes. He wants to be invited. He wants man to invite him in. But I'll tell you, he doesn't press himself upon anybody. And all of a sudden, here's Jesus walking down the side of the seashore. And I can see him putting his foot in the boat, ready to sail to the other side of the sea. And here comes running down the seashore this man that had just been saved, clothed, and in his right mind. And maybe he's ready to jump into the boat right next to him, anticipating the answer of yes. And he said, Jesus, I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm so glad I got a brand new beginning. I, I know you're leaving, Lord. I, don't, I want to be around you. Could I be with you? Can I tell you that's a great, great request? Can I tell you that's a great prayer? And, and you'd almost expect Jesus to turn around and say, wow, yeah, that's a great thing, jump into the boat. But all of a sudden, he didn't do that. He turned at him and put his hand up, and he said, no. And I want you to recognize there were no churches in that area. There were no other disciples in that area. There was no other scripture that he could get a hold of. Here's a man that had just been saved that Jesus left him by himself and told him no. When I went to Bible college, <laughs> I hadn't been saved but six months, went to Bible college. I knew nothing about the Bible when I got saved. How many of you kind of like I were? When you get saved, you just, the Bible was a foreign book to you. You didn't know anything about it. I didn't, I didn't know there were 66 books in the Bible. I didn't know it. I'd sit and listen to the preacher preach. He said, open your Bible to Hezekiah. And I said, where in the world's that? And I'd go back and look at an index of the Bible. I didn't, first of all, I had to find, is that Old Testament, New Testament? Then I looked down and find a page number. Then I turned to the page number. I'm going to note somebody next to me. What chapter is that? Hey, by the time I found it, he had already called another one, and I was lost. I mean, I didn't know where anything was in the Bible. I really didn't. I thought the Bible at first went from generation to revolutions. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know. I used to pronounce it's spelled the same way. I thought Job was Job. I didn't know the difference in it. I really knew very little. I went to Bible college and, and went with that kind of knowledge and saying, I, I hope they can help me. And a professor helped me a lot. He said this. He said, don't worry about it if you don't understand things in the Bible. I said, whew, I'm glad that one's over with. He said, every time you read the Bible, just keep reading, keep reading. And when you read something you don't understand, write the word why and put a question mark after it. And just leave it there. Next time you get to it, God will give you a little bit more understanding. That's pretty good advice, by the way. And if you could have seen my first Bible, I could have gone like that. And all you would have seen is why, 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 why. And I put a why next to this verse. Honestly. First time I read this, I said, what? Why would Jesus tell him that? He needed to be discipled. He'd just been saved. And the Lord turned to this man he had just answered the demons and said, okay, and granted the request. He had just answered the citizens who were not Christians. These citizens that said, get out of town. He honored their request and he began to leave. And here's a reasonable request from a man that had just been saved. I want to be with you. No. Why? I believe I have the answer. I believe the reason Jesus told him that is because there really is a place called hell. Notice what he told him to do. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things God has done for you. Urgent, get it done. There really is a hell, a literal burning hell. I left Seattle, Washington several years ago and I'd finished a crusade. We had, as I remember, 13, maybe 14 churches that had gathered together. And we had a building where we had, for seven days, went in and held an evangelistic crusade. It was tremendous. And I left, I got on a plane, and I was flying to Atlanta. I don't know if you know that in this section of the country or not. Probably so. 
But everywhere it seems I fly, I have to go through Atlanta. If I want to go anywhere, I have to go to Atlanta and go there. I'm not sure this is biblical, but I believe when Jesus comes back, I may have to go through Atlanta to go to heaven and transfer. I'm not sure. It just looks like I have to go through Atlanta. Here I am flying into Atlanta, a little over a five-hour flight. I settle back on an aisle. I like to sit on the aisle. And I look down in the pocket next to, you know, in the pocket ahead of me on the seat, and I see a U.S. News and World Report. And I see enough of the title to intrigue me, and I pulled it out. Because the title said this. It said, if there is a hell, it ain't too bad. And I said, what? And I pulled it out. It said, turn to page number 37. Had a picture on the front, a graphic picture. I turned to page number 37. I found an article that was written by an Episcopalian rector. I'm not trying to be demogatory towards any group. I'm just telling you, he's the one that wrote it. And he said this. He said, anybody with intellectual understanding knows there's no hell. He said, hell is a figment of man's imagination. He said, people have invented it and brought it up in order to control people. He said, the worst thing hell could be is some, something that you would dream of. He said, in fact, if you'd like to do it, you can have the most pleasant dream you could possibly have and you could say, that's hell for you. Hell is something different, he said, for everybody. Then a paragraph said this. He said, if the preachers in America would just preach what Jesus said about hell, they would not be preaching about the torment of hell. And I laughed, just like some of you are laughing. And the man next to me kind of looked at me and he got his attention. He said, that must be a humorous article. I said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to laugh so loud I invaded your privacy. He said, it's okay. He said, what is it? And I said, well, here's a man that said that if the preachers in America would just preach what Jesus said, they would not be preaching about the torments of hell. He said, well, honestly, I, I don't know. He said, I'm not a religious man. He said, I don't know anything about the Bible. In fact, I've never read much of the Bible. I really don't know. I said, would you do me a favor? He said, what's that? I said, my Bible is a red letter edition of the Bible. That means that the word Jesus said are in red. I'm going to give you a pencil or a pen. And would you take the gospel of Matthew and just read what's in red. Just the words that Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew. And every time Jesus teaches anything about sin, death, punishment, and hell, would you underline it? I said, it'll take you about 45 minutes. He said, I've never done anything like that. He said, that'd be a good religious activity. So he took my Bible and took a pen and he started doing it. Well, I was doing something else. I guess about 30 minutes went by. All of a sudden, he poked me and I said, what is it? He said, what in the world is that guy saying? I said, what do you mean? What have you discovered? He said, Jesus said there's fire in hell. Jesus said there's torment in hell. He said the thing that really got me is Jesus said, I should not fear somebody that can just destroy my body. He said, that's the biggest fear in America. That's terrorism and all the rest of it. But I ought to be afraid of somebody that can not only destroy my body, but my soul for all eternity in a place called hell. And I thank God I had the privilege of seeing that man settle where he's going to spend eternity in heaven before we landed in Atlanta. It's about two years after that, I was in Portland, Oregon. Same kind of thing. Had a great, great meeting with a number of churches and one of the members of one of the churches had some contact with one of the television studios downtown. And uh, they asked me if I'd come down and they could talk about our meeting and what I was speaking on and asked me some questions. And I had been interviewed by the secular media long enough to know that you better be kind of a little bit prepared to see what's gonna happen. But that didn't happen. The young lady that I went down there and talked to, she was very nice. And she asked some questions about themes I'm preaching on and why we're holding the meeting. And then right out of nowhere, she looked at me and said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. She said, what's so bad about hell? Just like that, on television. I did the best I could to answer her question. But I'd like to ask you that question tonight. Would you answer it? What is so bad about hell? I mean, so what if your wife is unsaved and goes to hell? Does that make any difference? Or maybe your children, 
Is it important to get your children saved? I mean, what difference does it make? Is hell bad? What's so bad about hell? If the people you work around, your neighbors, those that you meet, those you carry conversations on with, that you tell jokes together with and laugh together, and maybe share food together, I, I mean, what difference does it make if your friends die and go to hell? What's so bad about hell? There's no water in hell. Absolutely no moisture. There's no rain. There's no oceans. There are no rivers, tributaries, streams, no dew. Absolutely no water in hell. In fact, if you could take all the moisture of hell and get it together in one drop, it would not weigh enough to pull that drop off the tip of your finger. If my loved ones and your loved ones and our friends die and go to hell, they'll be in a place where their thirst, not just their thirst for water, but their thirst for sin that they've had a desire for on this earth. Somebody talks about people called in alcoholism and drugs. Do you know they'll have the same craving in hell forever and ever and ever, but there will be no satisfaction for any thirst. What's so bad about hell? I mean, does it make any difference? Should we warn people? Should we get people under the gospel? Should we really care? If our friends and our loved ones die and go to hell, they're going to be separated from all that is good forever. Think about that. This is a flat country. It's beautiful. But I'm going to tell you, there are no mountains in hell. How many of you like to visit the mountains once in a while? I do. I like them. I was in Las Vegas preaching in about a month ago on a meeting out there and drove about eight miles out and looked at the mountains. They're different than the mountains in this section of the country in the south and the east. They have trees on them. They don't. I mean, but both groups of mountains are beautiful. But there's nothing like that in hell. There are no trees in hell. There are no seasons in hell to enjoy. There are no leaves on the trees. There's no flowers in hell. There are no birds in hell. There are no children in hell. There's no music in hell. No poetry in hell. If our friends and our loved ones die and go to hell, they're going to be separated from all that is good forever. Think about that. We understand, according to the teaching of Jesus, that they'll be in torment eternal torment. And the Bible teaches there's fire in hell. It's hard to imagine the anguish of hell. And what it would be like for somebody just to drop into hell and to be there. One of the bad things about hell is this. Hell is a place of outer darkness. What in the world is outer darkness? In my research and what I'm able to study about it, outer darkness would be impossible for you and I to assimilate that here on this earth. It's a place where you would be suspended and it's absolutely pitch black and your eyes could be open, but you couldn't perceive where you were or even what position you were in. You could be accelerating to the right or maybe to the left or maybe thrown forward or backwards or maybe upside down and not know the difference. You could be rotating and that's for all eternity, a place of out of darkness. The nearest word that we got in English that equates to that is a four-letter word. And the word is lost. L-O-S-T, lost. If my friends and my loved ones die and spend eternity in hell, they're going to be lost forever. Maybe the one of the worst things about hell is how long people are going to stay there. Have you ever thought about that? Somebody tell me aloud if you would. How long will hell be there? Forever. Tell me aloud if you would. How long will heaven last? Same adverb. Same definitive word. You ever recognize this? If you're saved, 
If you're a Christian and you know Christ is your Savior, you're going to heaven when you die. But if your loved one or your friend dies, they're going to hell when they die. And the same words that talk about how long you're going to be in heaven describe how long they're going to be in hell. So while you're rejoicing about how long we're going to be in heaven, we need to remember our responsibility to make sure people don't spend that same amount of time in hell. How long is forever? Who could define it? Philosophers have tried. Scientists have tried. How long is forever? Maybe one of the things that I've read that may help us to understand a little bit about how long it is. Somebody wrote, if you would take a string or a cable and attach it to the earth and go 93 million miles through space and attach the other end of that cable to the sun and then come back 93 million miles and recruit an ant and take that ant and let him take one grain of sand, let him stand on that cable and at an ant's pace take one grain of sand and walk that cable 93 million miles until that ant arrived at the sun and then deposit that one grain of sand on the sun, then turn around and come back and pick up grain of sand number two, make the same trip up, come back empty, pick up grain of sand number three, rotate the trip again and come back and pick up grain of sand number four and five and six until that ant had taken every grain of sand off of every desert on this earth. Every grain of sand off of every seaside on this earth. Every grain of sand out from every other ocean that we have. In fact, every grain of sand out of every soil composite, one grain of sand at a time, at an ant's pace, one at a time, to the sun and deposit it all in one big pile, stand off and look at it, then reverse himself and take that sand back one grain of sand at a time and put it back where he took it originally that when that ant had finished that task, eternity will have just begun. So when you tell and think and pray about how long people are going to be in hell forever, don't just say forever. Somehow or another, we need to stretch it out in as many syllables as we can and as long as we can forever and ever and ever. The second church I had the privilege of starting was in Kentwood, Michigan. I always say Grand Rapids. It was right across the city line as a suburb of Grand Rapids. We went in and God began to bless and things happened. And I got a telephone call about nine months after I arrived in town from Grace Baptist Church in Montague, Michigan. How many of you know where Montague, Michigan is? It's right on the coast, right on Lake Michigan's coast, about 35 miles to the west of Grand Rapids. I got a call if I'd come down there and preach a revival from Sunday night through Wednesday night. So I preached at my church on Sunday morning. I went down to Grace Baptist Church and I preached Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. And God blessed and we had a great crowd. I mean, it was wonderful. On that last night, I brought a message that I bring quite often in Crusades that is a dramatized presentation on the crucifixion. And I brought that message and when I finished that message that night, the altars were filled and we had a lot of people saved. And people had given out tickets and promotion. They had invited people. And the building was full of people. We had a great meeting. I went back, got home late Wednesday night, got in my office early Thursday morning, and I told my secretary when I walked in, I said, listen, please hold any calls if you can a while or whatever. I've got a lot to do to catch up. Give me at least a couple hours. I went in the office to sit down. In about 15 minutes, the phone rung. And I picked it up. My secretary said, Brother Wood said, I know you said not to bother you if you could, but there's a lady on the phone from Montague, Michigan. And she said, it's urgent. She really needs to talk to you right now. I said, that's okay. I picked the phone up and pushed the button and began to talk to her. And she said, preacher, you may not remember me. And she gave me her name. She said, but I want to tell you this because you need to visit a man downtown in the burn unit of the hospital. I said, what do you mean? She said, there's a man down there that's burned severely in fact, it's life-threatening. You need to go see him. I said, well, as soon as I get everything done and can catch up sometime this afternoon, I'll run down. She said, you don't understand. You need to go right now. I said, why is that? She said, it happened last night. He should be dead. He's barely alive. He could die at any minute. He's lost. 
And if he dies, he's going to spend an eternity in hell. And I said, ma'am, I'll go right down. I hung the phone up and I drove downtown. I did not know what I'm going to tell you now. The man's name was Ray Russell. In that county where Montague, Michigan is, he was known as the most wicked man in the county. When he saw the revival flyers going up, he decided he would print what he called an anti-revival flyer. I never seen anybody do that before. I've never seen it do it since. And his flyer said something like this. It had a bottle of liquor on the front of it. And it said, any man in this town that will not go hear that preacher preach and get in that building of foolishness and come to the bar, I will buy his first two drinks. And he put those flyers all over town. I did not know this, but the same crowds I had at church, they had a crowd, not the same people, but in quantity, the same numbers of that bar. Men were flowing in and men were flowing out. That last night, because we had a rally, he had a rally. And he pumped the building full. And when I was driving back home from the revival meeting, he left that building with some woman. Never was discovered what kind of relationship they had. But he left that building and went to a trailer where he lived. He got out of his car and went inside of that trailer. She stood outside and waited till he got on the inside. She popped the trunk of the car, took out a five gallon can of gasoline, walked in that trailer and poured circles of gas around the man's body. Poured a trailer gas to the outside, took matches, threw it down and the fire began to burn on the inside. While he was in a drunken stupor on that couch, the fire, a ring of fire began to burn. By the time he was awakened, he could not escape. The fire and the police units were called. They say that when they took her and forced her down in the back of a car to lock her up, they say she was shouting to the trailer, go to hell, Ray Russell, go to hell. And he almost did. They pulled him out, took him to the hospital. I went downtown to visit him. When I walked in that area of the hospital, the burn unit, they said, Reverend, said, you don't want to go in there. It is one of the worst cases we've ever had. Said, it'll be hard for you to keep anything down that you've eaten, it is bad. I said, but he's unsaved, I need to talk to him. She said, yes, but, and I said, I'm going. They said, okay. So they put salve here so I couldn't smell much, and they put a mask and all this kind of stuff. And I walked into that room, and here was two arms up like this with galls on them, and a body that was wrapped around there were places on the body they could not put any kind of galls because of what had happened. One of his ears had burnt all the way down, the other halfway down, it had melted. It looked like his flesh had melted like it was wax. There was no hair anywhere that they had not woven over with that white gauze. One of his eyes had exploded, it got so hot. One of his lungs had collapsed. You could see certain elements of bone where the cheeks and the eyebrows had melted down. And with that one lung and a respirator, he began to <sighs> trying to keep his breath. I asked God for grace. and I went over that bed and looked over into that one eye looking up. I said, Ray Russell, my name is David Wood. I've come to tell you how you can go to heaven when you die. You're gonna die very soon. And you can go to heaven when you die, and that's where I want you to go. So I want you to listen to me very carefully. When I told him my name, he began to shake a little bit, and I wondered, why do you do that? He knew who I was. And I told him that I was a sinner, and he was a sinner. we all sinners. I told him that the wages of our sin, the penalty of our sin is death and hell. I told him how that Jesus loved him enough to go to the cross and shed his blood and pay the penalty for his sin. How that God did not want him to go to hell when he died. I told him if he'd believe that and receive Christ, that God had saved him. Then I said, let's, let's pray together. I didn't ask him, would you be willing to receive Christ? I said, let's pray together. I'm going to pray. You pray. And I want you to trust Christ right now. I was a little forward. I said, pray with me. Say, dear God. I didn't know what I was asking because he was unable to speak, but in a whisper, and it was broken. A little broken voice came over and said, Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner, 
And that same voice said, I know that, I know that, I, I know that, and I thought, surely this man's not going to say I'm not ready, or I've got more time, or wait until another day. I thought he was going to put it off. I wish you could have been there because all of a sudden he started praying on his own. He said, God, this preacher's told me that you love me. I don't see how you love me. I'm so wicked. And he prayed and talked to God and then he asked God to save him. He was gloriously saved. I, I do this so often when I lead people to Christ, I didn't think of what I was asking. I put my hand out in front of him and I said, Ray, if you really meant that, I want you to reach out and take my hand and then I thought of what I was asking this man to do whose body had been so mutilated by fire and wrapped up in gauze. I was going to take it back but while my hand was there, one of his big old hands went over like that and fell on mine. Then his other hand came over and fell on top of mine and he said, I meant it. I meant it with all my heart. Ray Russell lived 37 more days. Every day he lived, I was in the hospital room by his request because he had called in a special nurse and he gave her a list that she'd write down of names of men. Everyone I'm lost, everyone I'm wicked in that county. And he wanted those men to come to his hospital room. He staggered them out at different intervals of time. Those men would walk in the hospital room, I'd be standing next to the wall in a very feeble voice He'd say, this is my preacher. Listen to him carefully. And ladies and gentlemen, before that man died, 72 big men received Jesus Christ as their Savior in that room. Jesus, what is it? Can I be with you? No, not now. Why? I'm coming back soon. You're going to be in heaven soon. You're going to get your glorified body soon. You're going to spend eternity with me soon. But I've got the major task of your life before you. What is that? I want you to go home to your friends and tell them what great things God has done for thee. Now I want to do something right now. I want you to follow with me very, very carefully. Because most of us in this room feel this way, honestly. Most of us feel that the preacher is important. And he's got talents or maybe gifts or, or maybe an associate pastor or maybe a deacon or maybe somebody that may be a special singer or preacher. Oh, those people, but not me. I can't do it. I can't go home and tell my friends. I can't be used of God. It's not for me. I'm a spectator. I couldn't possibly be a participator. So if you'll allow me to do it, I want to take about three minutes and show you how important you are how important you are to God. If you were not this important, you would not be here. God would have already taken you home to heaven. Watch very carefully. And Jonathan, I'm gonna ask you to help me if you would. I'm gonna ask you a question. I'd like you to answer that question with a yes if you would. Just good and loud so people that you won't have any problem, you'll like the question. Would you be willing to tell others about Jesus and be a soul winner? Wonderful, would you stand? Now, as a soul winner, his job is to invite people in where they can be under the gospel or to win them to Christ, to try to love them, try to follow up. So I want you to turn around and point to one person that you'd like, just one person here, anybody. And would you stand? Now, with both of them standing, both of them have been reached. Now, I want each one of you to stand and point to one person. Just quickly, go ahead, one person, anybody. Now, we got four. Now, I want each one of you to point to one person. Now I want each one of you to point to one person. Now each of you standing, I want you to point to one person. Now each of you standing, please point to one person. Now those that are standing, point to one other person. Now you that are standing, would you point to one person? Let's not forget the people way back here that need God. <laughs> Amen. All right. Each of you standing, point to someone else around you, anyone. Now, all that are standing, even if you have to point way at the back, point at somebody else. Let's do it one more time. And I know we'll have everybody, everybody standing, turn and point to one person. 
Now, with everyone standing, would you look at me? I'm going to move you forward in time. Go home to your friends. And I want you to tell them what great things God's done for you. And you said, yes, I'll do that, didn't you? Yes, I'll do that. So he told somebody, and then both of them told somebody else, and those four told somebody else, and here we are. And so I want to move you forward from tonight to right after the trumpet sounds and the rapture happens and you're in heaven, standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus looked down at you, Jonathan, and he said, look around. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. How many of you, when Jesus comes back, want to hear that, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Well, we all do. But you say, preacher, am I really important? Watch. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to say no. Say it good and loud if you would. You ready? Would you be willing to tell others about Jesus and do the best you can to get them to God? Would you do that? No? Then would you be seated? Now watch, folks. Watch, folks. Every one of you that are standing because he said yes a minute ago, would you be seated? That's how important you are. That's how important you are. And you. And you. And you. And this precious young man I'm looking at right here. And his dad and mom. And you. And back in the back. And you. Every child of God in this room. That's how important you are. Look at what Jesus said one more time. I don't think he said it hateful. I think he said it with promise in his voice. Can I be with you? No. But I got something so important. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things God has done for thee. Let's bow our heads for a moment and our eyes are closed.